Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices stage, Lisa Ann Gershwin, Mark Dion, and J.D. Talasek. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'm J.D. Talasek. I, I was here last year about the same time uh, with you as we were kick, kicking off NACFI, National Academies mm -hmm. Keck Futures Initiative. And um, we were here with Roger Molina and had a, a wonderful conversation about the intersections of art and science. And today, Mark and Lisa help us put the finishing touches on an exhibit called The Trouble with Jellyfish. And this was an exhibit that was a collaboration between Mark and Lisa that was born at the Le Laboratoire in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's a space that is neither a science space nor an art space, but an experimentation space, a collaboration space, a space where dialogue happens uh, across many disciplines often. But I wonder if we might start with that. How did that come about? How did, uh, how did you two meet, and uh, how did you start this exhibit that, we're, that we'll see tonight after the uh, talk? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, you know the, the sort of mastermind of La Laboratoire is is Dave Edwards, and Dave Edwards is a uh, an educator, an inventor, and a person who's really passionately uh, invested in the in the relationship of art and science. And he runs La Laboratoire in this very experimental way. It's I, I like to think about it as he sets up these blind dates between scientists and artists, right? And kind of brings them together to see if things work, if there's some way to, uh, to, to make something happen. And that, what that something is is very often an exhibition. And, and Dave is very interested in, in the senses. So often there are exhibitions about um, uh, about smell, about sounds, about new tactile te technologies. Mm -hmm. And years ago, he approached me uh, when La Laboratoire was still in Paris about doing an exhibition that had something to do with the Iceman that had been found from the receding glaciers. And I thought, well, the Iceman is extremely interesting, but, interesting, but I, I don't really have anything to say about that. There's <laughs> nothing really, there's nothing there for me. And I'm, I'm not a um, you know, forensic archaeologist. So uh, maybe six or seven years later, I get a call and saying, what about jellyfish? <laughs> and I think, jellyfish, now that's something, you know, that's something really exciting and okay, interesting. Okay, but to be fair, you had a collection at that point of jellyfish art. Yeah, that's true. I'd already started collecting some of the things you'll see in the exhibition. And, and I had also, uh, I think, read the piece that was in the, the New York Review books about mm -hmm. your book. So... That was very fresh on my mind, and so David brought us together, and uh, and and a lot of the issues that um, that Lisa addresses in her work are issues that are very important to me. Things like invasive species—that's a topic I've worked a lot on—and um, and all and, and problems in the kind of general biodiversity crisis. And also, I'm I'm you know I'm a coastal person. I came from New Bedford, Massachusetts, so. I'm always very invested in, in marine issues. Mm -hmm. Well, to understand how you came together, maybe we should talk a little bit about your work individually. Lisa, let's, what, what is the trouble with jellyfish? <laughs> what, tell, tell us about your work. Yeah, well, so, um, ah, where to start? Um, so I, I'm just a scientist. Um, just a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I say that with air quotes. Um, but... Yeah, I've been working with jellyfish, you know, all aspects of um, jellyfish biology and ecology, taxonomy, evolution, um, you know, toxinology. I mean, you, you know, you name it, just about every aspect of jellyfish for about 25 years. And um, uh, in 2011, I started writing a book about, um, well, about the trouble with jellyfish. It's called Stung. And, um, you know, it, it, I guess it would be easier to talk about how it came about because the story of what, it's, what it means is really in how it came about. Um, I was at dinner. Um, it was New Year's night of 2011, uh, so January 1st. And I was at dinner at a friend's neighbor's house with uh, these people that I had never met, you know, her neighbors and their friends and whatever. And, you know, we're having this dinner and, 
we're having this conversation, and you know, inevitably they say, so what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a marine biologist. Oh, really fascinating. Uh, what do you work on? Jellyfish. Oh, really? Huh. Why? You know, this kind of thing. Yeah. And you know, so we got to talking, and I said, um, well, you know, I, I work on um, you know, different things and this and that, new species and whatever. And they said, so why would I care about jellyfish? And I said, oh, well, I mean, there's lots to, oh, sorry, before they said, why would I care? They said, are they good for anything? And I said, <laughs> well, you know, that's a funny question, isn't it? I mean, philosophically, does something have to be good for something to be worthy of life? And, oh, well, I don't know, kind of, you know. And they said, well, why should we care about jellyfish, or should we? And I said, yeah, we should. And I started explaining about how, you know, in some places around the world, um, you know, jellyfish are kind of flipping ecosystems to being dominated by jellies. And they got really fascinated with this. And, you know, so they started asking more questions. Well, how do they do that? And I explained about how... Um, you know, we're taking out their predators and competitors, and this is leaving jellyfish without predators and competitors, which is great for them. And as waters are warming, you know, this amps up their metabolism, so they eat more and they grow faster and they reproduce more, and all of this. And as I was explaining this, you could see these people who have never thought about marine biology, never thought about jellyfish, and their minds were ticking. And they were getting kind of agitated, like, wait a second, you know, how come we've never heard about this before? And, you know, so that's kind of where the conversation was going. And they said, hang on, there should be books about this. Like, people should know about this. And I went, oh, you know, whatever. And they said, you should write a book about this. And I said, well, that's actually the second time I've heard that in a couple of weeks. And they said, no, seriously, you should write a book about that. And I kind of went, hmm. So over the next maybe five or ten minutes, I worked out the opening, chap uh, sorry, the opening paragraph to my book. And so I'm, I'm there, and I'm not even listening to what they're saying at that point. I'm just going. And all of a sudden, then I said, I, I, I'm so sorry. I, I got to go. Oh, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I got to go. So I went back to my neighbor's house where I, or, sorry, their neighbor's house where I was staying and I curled up in bed, brought the laptop onto my lap, and started typing. And about five days later, I had not the whole book, of course, but I had the table of contents, I had the chapters laid out, I had the framework of the chapters. And then over the next five and a half months, it was just a matter of filling in the stories and fleshing it out. But in those first five days that I really pretty much just had my friend deliver food to me, um, I, I, I wrote the main part of the book. So it was kind of this story that wanted to be told. And the whole book only took five months, five and a half months. But Lisa, you know, it's like, I, I just, I, I'm, I've gotten to know you through creating this <laughs> exhibit and just really have enjoyed talking to you. I think, you know, the, the fact that they were responding to something that you were talking about, that they were excited about, had probably more to do with your nature of explaining it and almost the poetic sense that you bring to it and the love and the passion. I want to bring this back into Mark and talk about um, how, you know, this kind of interaction and this conversation, how, how did this blind date between artists and scientists <laughs> go? Can you, Mark, maybe for those in the audience that don't know sort of your vernacular of work, can you talk just a little bit about your work yeah. and how, how to approach it in a sense? I mean, formally, it's, it's complex because I do sculpture, I do installation, which is really when you're transforming a space, an environment, instead of just an object. And I also do large-scale public work. So there's a lot of different kinds of expressions, but, but my topic, my concerns are really around what, what I call the culture of nature and, and the sort of history of natural history. So I'm very interested in and what are the ways that we as a society tell the story of what gets to be called nature at a particular time for a particular group of people? So that's the, my sort of site of investigation. And also how ideas that are not science, ideas that are maybe ideology, sneak in, or pseudoscience, sneak into that language and, and what kinds of problems that causes, right? So, so that's what I'm interested in. I, and I look to my sources of inspiration at the history of science, which is a, a history that has a very rich visual territory, right? Natural history museums 
feel very much like sculpture to me and like installation to me. And, and of course, the history of, of um, the, you know, the history of, of graphic prints and, and, and uh, scientific illustration evolve, co-evolve with science. So there's just like this very strong visual culture in science that, I, that I'm, I'm interested in having a dialogue. But very often my approach is, is that of, of a historian. I, I'm sort of a, a, a historian of science. At the same time, a lot of my work is motivated by a concern for the um, you know, biodiversity crisis, by, by some, of the, some of the things that we're facing now um, um, with decreasing, diver um, uh, decreasing lack of or loss of diversity around the world. So the work maybe superficially even looks a little bit like something you might see in a natural history museum. I use some of the same uh, visual vocabulary, but I'm trying to talk about things a little bit different from that. And I, so I think David kind approached... Of pushing the, pushing yeah. the barrier a little bit. And, yeah. and also, you know, having a small, some degree of, of scientific literacy, of course, is, is an important part of being able to work in this, in this way. And I, and I often work um, with scientific institutions. I've been the artist in residence at the Natural History Museum in London for a couple of years and helped them organize their exhibition on, uh, on the, uh, celebrating the 300th year birthday of Linnaeus. And I've worked with zoos and conservation organizations and the Oceanographic Museum and uh, Aquarium in Monaco. So I, I partner up with, with um, scientists and scientific institutions fairly frequently. So you had mentioned uh, when this connection had been made with David Edwards that you already had a collection of jellyfish prints. Yeah. But you're not just a normal collector. <laughs> You, 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 I would say that probably a lot of your material, your medium is objects and sort of the meaning and the, and the, the visual uh, culture that comes out of objects in this sort of vernacular. So yeah, you, have, you have quite a, I, I believe I understand you have like a barn full of collected <laughs> items. I have a lot of things, you know, I mean, yeah. I'm very, I, things are my material and, and mm -hmm. I'm not really, as a sculptor, I work with pre-existing things. So, you know, like I, I always say, some, some people paint, some people take photographs, some people sculpt, I shop. That's my medium, <laughs> I am a shopping artist. And, and part of that shopping also included this collection of, of jellyfish prints that I started long before I, I had ever met, I, I had met Lisa. And I'm telling you, it's an amazing collection, seriously. Even someone like me who's kind of a, you know, jellyfish um, person, um, yeah, it, it, it's a pretty impressive collection. <laughs> so, so tell me more about how this collaboration started. How did you get into this? Because, I mean, you both very clearly said you're storytellers in different ways. And so I could see how this sort of commonality and this sort of enthusiasm. But can you talk a little bit more about the process? Well, you know, one of the things that really attracted me to Lisa's work is, is I have a, a huge amount of respect for what people who I would call public intellectuals. So you easily could have stayed in your scientific field and written peer-reviewed papers on jellyfish for an entire career, and no one in the public would have known about this work. You know? um, but you, you made the decision to write a very popular book. And for me, I find that to be a very courageous and, and a really <laughs> honorable practice for a scientist. I, I kind of certainly wish a lot more scientists would take that effort and energy to, to communicate with a broader public. So that was one of the things that really made me want to do this because Lisa's the kind of scientist that I admire the most, the, the kind that really spends the energy to make their research available and relevant to a broader public. You know, I think the public really wants to understand what's going on in the world around them. You know, I, I get this so much everywhere I go, everyone I talk to, um, you know, people really want, you know, it, it, people know that something's going on and they know that there's interesting stuff out there and, you know, there's this sort of gut feeling that the general public has that if only they could know a little bit more right. and kind of um, beyond the Attenborough, you know, like what's actually the whole story behind Attenborough. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they really, and, and not just the, the ooh-ah of cool stuff, 
but how it relates to them and how changes that they are observing in their own communities relate to them. I think people really want to know. And I think as scientists and as artists, I think we can and I might argue should, <laughs> uh, although I mean, I, I, I kind of stopped short of that because I don't, I, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable telling another person you should do that. Mm -hmm. But for me, I feel like that's an important part of what I do and my role as a scientist and an artist is to help people who want to understand science and support science and integrate it into their world to be able to do that. Right. So, I don't know, I mean, for me it just comes naturally to write mm -hmm. because I think I have that desire to help people understand yeah. the world around them. So, so, you know, I mean, very often when I'm working with scientists and, and I'm the artist in residence, I understand what I get out of it, but I'm not always sure what the scientist or the scientific institution gets out of it. And in this case, that wasn't the situation because I thought, well, what I have is, is the ability to make exhibitions. That's what I do. I, you know, I, I've made hundreds of exhibitions. And that's something that Lisa's um, work and her hypothesis, could, that, that really could lend itself to being an exhibition and to right. creating a, a very kind of complex kind of exhibition, not, not something that's a, a kind of clear didactic exhibition like you might see at a science center, but something right. that's deeper, something that hooks the viewer in a more complex way, something that, you know, one of the things that is different between making exhibits for a, a scientific institution, making art exhibits, is that the methodologies and the strategies of art are, are less clear cut. There are a lot mm -hmm. of things that you can, there's a lot, of, there's different vocabulary in art, right? So right. we have access to things like humor and irony, and we can express things that are very complex, like ambivalence and, and melancholy, and these things that, that are really hard to do in a, in a straightforward didactic. So I thought that's what we, I could lend to. But, but, but you also said this earlier, because we were talking about science, science museums and the, you know, the context of different types of exhibits. You said oftentimes science museums not only tell you what the answers are, they also tell you the questions. Right. They're very, they're very you know, lead, or they can be very leading, which you, I'm sorry, you were going to say something. No, but I was, I was going to say exactly that. I was going to say that, you know, science and scientists are expected to answer questions, whereas art is expected to ask questions. And I think when you can marry those two together to ask new questions that science can't ask, and then you have the science to sort of answer the parts of those that science can answer, leaving, I think, some of the coolest parts of the questions, which is the parts we don't know yet, yeah. then it or, starts to become or, very interesting. Or, or that we don't know yet, or that there's, there's still controversy around, yeah, which yeah, actually exactly. brings us back to the trouble with jellyfish is, you know, that I think science museums might shy away from this topic because there's not consensus yet. That's not to say that it's, you know, bad science or wrong science. It's just that there isn't common agreement. I wonder, since we're kind of using this, uh, uh, the idea of an exhibit as a platform for discussion, can you, can you inform us of, of what this controversy is? Can you tell us a little bit about this, the science of this? Yeah, yeah. So like so many things in science, um, you know, there is uh, debate and discussion about, um, you know, are jellyfish taking over the world? Are they not taking over the world? Are they taking over some of the world? Are they not, you know, like whatever. There's this, there's this debate and, you know, some scientists hold this view and some scientists hold that view and, you know, there's all this you know, it, lively debate and discussion, which of course, you know, is where the science gets really cool because, you know, you can sort of come to a higher understanding through these discussions. Um, so, I, I guess in its very essence, the debate boils down to, um, so there is not a lot of uh, debate around are jellyfish responding to human impacts 
in places with a lot of human impact. I think that part everybody's going, yeah, yeah, they're, they're totally responding to that and doing that. But then there's the bigger question of, okay, the places that aren't so impacted yet or places that aren't yet impacted at all, are they going to go down that or, you know, how, which species are increasing or decreasing or, you know, because some are increasing and some are decreasing, can you say there's a pattern? You know, so there's these debates. And I, I think it's fantastic. And, uh, you know, so in science we have these debates and sometimes they degenerate into, you know, like kind of debates, you know. But in art, <laughs> oh, sorry about the animal noises, you know. <laughs> But, you know, in art, you can actually talk about these in whole new ways without having to make animal noises, you know. And, and, and you can actually explore these types of ideas and open up whole new types of discussions that scientists in a more traditional scientific capacity um, might feel a little bit more siloed. But when you put it into an art context, all of a sudden you break down those silos and you can have these discussions and kind of come to a new understanding. Mm. I, are I, are, I we, are cool. we really <laughs> breaking down the silos when we're doing that? Or is, I mean, how has this been received, the, well, the I, press? I, th and I think one thing is, and we, we, I think um, within our audience, we think very highly of our audience, right? So. Mm. Obviously, calling something the trouble with jellyfish. Well, you know, there is no trouble with jellyfish. We are the trouble, you know. And so, <laughs> right. so we intentionally kind of mislabel the exhibition, the trouble with jellyfish, hoping that our audience will very soon come to the conclusion that everything that's supposed to be trouble with jellyfish or trouble is trouble for the ocean that we are causing, right? So that's that's something that I feel very confident that the audience, at least the audience at La Lab and the audience here, they get that. I mean, that, this right. is a very sophisticated audience and I put a lot of energy and, and belief into that level of sophistication that they're going to be able to, uh, to tease out that, quest, that, that, mm -hmm. that the, the mistitle of the piece very quickly. Um, but also, like the, the exhibition at La Lab, which is a little different from the exhibition here, had a, a very strong kind of emotional arc in that we wanted different things to happen in the, th there were three parts of that exhibition. So the first is what we call the jellyfish salon, which feels a little bit like Captain Nemo has invited you to tea, right? <laughs> and so you come into this space and you find these early representations of jellyfish. These are representations of jellies before underwater photography, before the popularity of the aquarium. So when it's very hard for people to actually observe jellyfish in their natural aquatic environment. So there's lots of kind of fantasies and projections of what jellyfish look like. And also jellyfish are kind of hard to represent because they're always moving. They're not really, they don't really have a kind of solid form in the way that a horse does say. Um, and <laughs> well, and, and you take them out of the water and they look very yeah. blobular, you know? <laughs> so so that, that's a kind of interesting problem in itself that, that these that these uh, representations focus on. But anyway, you move through that space and, and you see these, um, these representations and you see early um, scientific charts on jellyfish. And then you encounter actual living uh, moon jellies, which are fantastic and beautiful and they have that kind of grace and elegance and, uh, and uh, the, the kind of uncanny um, uh, anatomy that we think about with jellyfish. So that's the part where I want, as an exhibition designer, I want people to come out of that loving jellyfish. Then we move into the part we call the, the classroom. So that was the, that was the sugar, now comes the medicine. And the classroom <laughs> really frames the, the problems with, um, with uh, jellyfish that are happening because of, of our environmental disruption. So that's very straightforward and very didactic and, and speaks very clearly. And then the last part of the piece in Cambridge was we had, there, David Edwards teaches a class at Harvard called How to Make Things and Have Them Matter, which is an environmental entrepreneurial class. So the idea is students take on an environmental issue 
and then they come up with a solution. And of course, it's Harvard, so no one would ever think about saving the planet unless you could make a ton of money doing it as well. <laughs> right? And so that's their kind of motivation. So they came up with different kinds of solutions to look at the, at the issue. Everything from the, if you can't beat them, eat them thing, where you could, imagining turning jellyfish collagen into food additive, to um, uh, ideas of turning jellyfish and actually, into paper towels. And, and if I can just interrupt for a minute, don't wince when he talks about jellyfish as food additives. Um, this was actually fantastic. In Cambridge, we created what we called the Bloom Bakery. This was um, some of the students' project. And um, they actually uh, used jellyfish as a fat-free egg substitute in baked goods. And we served um, cupcakes that were made with the jellyfish ingredient. And they were good. They were good. <laughs> so don't laugh too hard. Don't judge jellyfish too hard. So was... regretfully, as, as Mark said, that was in Cambridge. So we don't have jellyfish cupcakes for each other. Yeah. No, I don't know. so yeah. sorry. Uh, so, so sorry. So but, but watch this space. I think yeah. Um, yeah. they're certainly going to be patenting so, that. So, there, so there's elements of that. And, and, and so there are videos. And there's I think some of those videos came from yes, that, exactly. which are on display here. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, video uh, especially the commercial ones that uh, <laughs> that you created. Because so, we're going to see a couple of these, I think. In the I mean, one, the, the students focused a lot on the idea that, of course, to make, to, they weren't really solving the problems of why there are jellyfish blooms, but rather, sol but rather looking at the idea of how do we make it possible to control blooms by making jellyfish worth something, right? So they would be harvested. Um, and so that, of course, meant making them into products. But if jellyfish are, you know, 99% water, so there's not a lot of product there. But what is there is sort of collagen, which has some uses. And also, so, so some people looked at turning them into paper towels because they do have super absorbent uh, material with its left. And so we have a commercial that we designed for that. And then another group were really interested in the idea of using a drone technology to locate jellyfish uh, blooms. So we've created a kind of also another commercial that's more along the lines of an industrial, like something that you would see from the military industrial complex, one of their, like, like Grumman or United Technologies commercials. So those are, are kind of commercial spoofs in a way that mm -hmm. uh, we're using here to, to uh, intersect with Lisa's um, presentation on, on, uh, on jellyfish. Which, which is absolutely wonderful because it has Lisa's personality. So you're, you're, you're being educated about jellyfish, but it's got Lisa's uh, you know, charm and charisma uh, coming through, which is, again, I think why your friends that you're having dinner with were so <coughs> excited about hearing about jellyfish. They were excited about hearing you talk about jellyfish, which is really inspiring. Uh, but again, you know, we're kind of going back to this idea of the storytelling, and I, and I, I'm just kind of wondering about the different sort of contexts. I, I mean, the, the exhibit for me feels like so much of what comes out of Logo Warta as uh, as a platform for dialogue, you know, which is you know why we're here and we're we're talking about that, and then um, going through. So I wonder if we could go back to uh, sort of the responses that you got, um, either your own personal response to the experience of working together, um, the responses of other people. In the, how, how effective was this as a platform for discussion or even generating new ideas? I think it was amazing. I mean, so opening night at the Cambridge exhibition was surreal. It was like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. There were, the place was packed, and people were so completely responding to the exhibition as art, the exhibition as science, the exhibition as art science. Um, they were responding to, um, you know, the idea about never having thought about jellyfish ever in their lives, and all of a sudden they're thinking about them in this complex way as something beautiful something um, playing a role both as a visible indicator of changes in the ocean and 
as, you know, in some places a driver for further change in the ocean, and also as a resource for actually making money. And, you know, right there it was presented all together. And, you know, these people were really responding to that. So many people came up to me that night really excited about never having thought about jellyfish ever in their lives. And all of a sudden, their mind was just firing off like that. And, you know, with excitement, not fear or anything like that, but excitement. And so that was, that was pretty exciting. And, and, you know, we even had squillions of people doing jellyfish selfies and tweeting these jellyfish selfies. And uh, what was I think it was 6,500 jellyfish selfies it was trending that night, which just blew my mind. I, I don't know Twitter so well, but I think that's... But you're on Instagram now because you told me that you, you started an account today. I so did. We'll I did. Start I started for Instagram you. today. Yeah, so. Great. So, Mark, what, what are your thoughts? You know, when it comes to effectiveness or it comes to, like, assessing... Um, um, assessing an artwork is a really difficult thing, right? It's not something that essentially one doesn't make an artwork to come up with a, um, to elicit a, a specific response in a way. So I think it's always difficult to come up with kind of the terms that one would evaluate art in that sense. But I mean, I, I, I think certainly that, you know, we had mission, the mission of kind of making this an exhibition that was that it was evocative and it turned people's attention to this interest and into this issue and also it certainly was informative and we have also this small booklet that we made um, which is uh, which is a kind of takeaway which is a beautifully de designed little field guide and, and that, so that that's a kind of quite a nice element that continues to have a kind of informative aspect but I, I think you know that's when you look at an artwork that idea of is it effective is not necessarily the right question. Okay. You know, and, is and, there and, a better and, word and, for and it? I, and I think that that's kind of one of the more interesting differences mm -hmm. um, between maybe art and, and environmental education, where you really are trying to bring someone to a certain point. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of what I was trying to do with that exhibition and with this exhibition is to um, you know, create a kind of discursive space, to create a space where people can do what Lisa was saying for the first time in their lives, think about jellies and think about uh, uh, this kind of ocean um, conservation issues in, a, in, a, in maybe a different way, in, mm -hmm. in a less, a more expansive and less conclusive way. Right. I, I want to end on, on, on this, but I want to give a couple of shout outs. Uh, Mick, who asked the question earlier, runs the Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous at the University of Los Angeles. So I would like for you to find him during the reception and ask him about that. And if anyone uh, has been to uh, the Laguna, Art Muse uh, Laguna Beach Art Museum, uh, I'd like to introduce the artist uh, Philip K. Smith III. Uh, please uh, ask him about his exhibit if you haven't seen it. One request, let, uh, let our, our guests get up to the atrium. I mean, if you, I know you want to talk to them. Let's get them out to the reception as well. But please uh, help me thank Mark and Lisa.